Welcome to Corona Q&A this Sunday night. I'm really glad that you've joined us tonight. Uh, and I hope the next uh, hour or so as we answer your questions uh, is beneficial for you. My name's Tim Stevens. I'm the Youth Encourager for the Armadale Diocese. Uh, don't forget in the chat box to the right of this video to say hi. Let us know where you're watching from this evening. Uh, we'd love to know who's tuning in and who's making benefit of these Q&As. Uh, put your questions there as well. Uh, this is our last Q&A for a couple of weeks. 
There's some of us that are having some time off. Uh, so this will be our last Q&A for a couple of weeks, but put your questions in there for when we do Q&A again uh, so that we've got questions uh, to answer. Uh, this week I am joined and I'm going to change the introductions a little bit today because we had a pro wrestling bombshell last week. So this week uh, we are joined by Steve, the Uncle Price. I was thinking Stone Cold. <laughs> Steve Stone Cold Price. Uh, Keta the Hippie, Alan from Moree, and uh, Mike the Hammer Dicker from Youth Works <laughs> in Sydney. <laughs> Nice one. I was wondering what was going to happen there. It was going to be the Hulk. Yeah, the hammer. I'll take hammer. I'll yeah, take you can be you can be the hammer. And um, what are you, Tim? Uh, What's your the name? Undertaker. <laughs> the Undertaker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that. I do a lot of funerals, so probably the Undertaker. <laughs> probably not all that too far from the truth. But um, <laughs> Welcome, guys. It's great to have you with us uh, this evening. Great to have Mike from YouthWorks uh, with us. If you kind of vaguely recognise Mike, uh, he came and spoke on one Peter at Youth Muster a couple of years ago. Um, but youth turn over pretty quickly, so you might have no idea who he is, uh, but he's a good friend of ours, and it's great to have him with us uh, this evening. And our first question for tonight goes to Mike, because he's our newcomer. Can you tell us, brother, how did you become a Christian? Yeah, I was introduced to Jesus, I guess, at the earliest age because my parents were Christians and so they raised me knowing Jesus and I always knew him and loved him. And I grew up in a, a Baptist church and so uh, I was at the age of 11 when I was kind of, you know, asked week after week whether or not I wanted to become a Christian. And I remember having these kind of dreams, like nightmares, really thinking, I don't, you know, I don't want to go to hell. I know Jesus, love Jesus. I, I need to make this commitment public at some point. And so at age 11, I made that commitment. And in the church I went to, that meant uh, I went up the front of the church and uh, kind of declared that Jesus was my Lord and Savior. And then got baptized in a big bathtub at the front of our church. Uh, and then I started high school and high school was a very kind of up and down, tumultuous time for me. And I remember at the end of high school thinking, I'm not a particularly good Christian. And I think uh, if I'm really going to put my money where my mouth is, I either have to follow Jesus all the way or just give this thing up. Because uh, I spent every day kind of walking to school, praying, you know, Jesus help me to be a good Christian. And then every afternoon walking home from school, praying, oh, Jesus, forgive me. And, uh, and I think at the end of that time, I was pretty, I was 50-50, I, was I reckon. But uh, God in his grace really kept me firm in his grip. And uh, at the end of high school, I went on a, um, a scripture union family mission. Uh, I know there's one in Gunnada, uh, on the in, inland, but I went to one on the coast down in Kyola. And uh, that was a really transformative kind of experience for me where I really got to um, know the gospel again, believe it, because I had to tell other people about it. And, you know, you can't really tell someone about the gospel of Jesus unless you believe it. So that was really what kind of consolidated my faith. But, you know, I think really, had I become a Christian, I think actually I've been a Christian uh, my whole life. But I had those moments at, when I was 11. And I guess, again, yeah. at the end of the 12, about 17, 18. Mm. Very good. That's the quick version. How does, um, ha how does, how does someone become a Christian then and end up as the, the Dean of Students at YouthWorks College? It must be Good question, because be I, uh, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't have much of an ambition uh, to be uh, anything to do with the college at all, really, when I finished high school. I was just lucky to even get a um, register a, a score in the HSC, and I wanted to be a greenkeeper. Out of all things, I thought, sitting on a lawnmower, like cruising around a golf course, or maybe even doing the SCG, that would be a good job. Uh, and in the end, I ended up doing a trade as a, a fire sprinkler fitter. And uh, like, I love doing a trade. I love building stuff with uh, my hands and, and, and working stuff out. And so that's what I did. And if you don't know what a fire sprinkler fitter is, just think of a plumber, except better. Um, and uh, we don't play with poo and wee. <laughs> we just do the kind of high pressure, you know, sprinkler systems that you see in the movies. It's all kind of Hollywood style stuff. Yeah. And um, uh, after that kind of uh, venture as a tradesman for ages, I ended up kind of um, going to do a, a two year uh, ministry training apprenticeship in a church, an Anglican church. And I thought, oh, I'll just give it two years, see what happens. 
and uh, two years kind of rolled in for three, four, and then eventually I think I was at Petersham Anglican Church for uh, 15 years. Uh, no, six, 15, 15 years, I think. And um, uh, in that did a, uh, a diploma of theology and youth ministry at YouthWorks College, did a degree in theology at Moore College, and then ended up at uh, working at YouthWorks College. So it's a bit of a, it's a funny old world, the way things work out, but God opens doors. And I just breeze yeah. on through is what I do. Cool. I like how you just, you, you couldn't work out whether it was 14, 15 or 16 years, but um, that period of time at Petersham is probably longer than the life of most of the people watching this tonight. So <laughs> it's a significant amount of time. Yeah, I was doing a, I was doing a youth talk actually, Dan, um, in the Southern Highlands in Sydney a couple of years ago. And I was going to start off my talk with a story about the 2000 Olympics. <laughs> and then I realized actually no one in the room was born when the 2000 Olympics were on. I was like, oh, oh this is showing me to be the relevant youth pastor. That's right. But you, can, you, can, you can rotate talks pretty frequently because they, um, you only need a five year plan, don't you? And you just do it again. Yeah. Hey, I forgot what I said last week, so, you know, <laughs> quick rotation. What were you going to say, Steve? Oh, I was just going to say, speaking of relevant and the whole um, fancy plumber thing, Tim, I believe you've been having some uh, troubles with some block pipes recently at your place. Yeah, so we, so this is, um, we're filming this on Saturday night, uh, the day before it will go to air on Sunday night. But um, the, this morning we woke up and we had uh, all of Gyra's sewerage uh, flowing through our backyard. Wait for the lawn. Sorry, <laughs> it'll be really good for the lawn. Oh, the, the lawn's going to love it. But um, <laughs> but but Mike's saying that sprinkler fitters are like plumbers, but better. I'm, yeah. I'm I'm pretty high on plumbers at the moment. They came with their thing and they blocked it. They they unblocked it and everything. And yeah. If they did their job properly in the first place, Tim, you wouldn't have all the sewage of Gyra flowing yeah. through your backyard. I think the, the problem. Same. I think the problem is that is that they did the job a hundred years ago. <laughs> anyway, the, the people of Gyra have changed their diets in recent times that I'm sure have the pipes can't cope with. Yeah. We anyway. These um these Q and A's always have a way of bringing in poo, and um <laughs> we seem to be bringing it in earlier and earlier. Uh, every week. Anyway, we this week. So let's um, let's crack on with some actual questions that we've got, and um, stop talking about poo. Um, in uh, John chapter four, verse eighteen, it says that there is no fear in love. Uh, it also says that God is love, and His love for us is perfect. If this is true, why does the Bible also say we must fear Him? Pricey. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, I've got, I think you can answer this uh, kind of on two fronts. The first one would be just related to the context of what it's actually talking about in 1 John chapter 4. Um, so in verse 17, immediately before it, it's talking about um, fear of judgment, um, like so at death. Um, so the kind of love that, that um, drives out fear or the, the fear that doesn't have sorry, the love that doesn't have fear in it is to do with because we have God's love um, for each of us, we don't need to fear judgment, don't need to fear death, uh, which is awesome. That's great. That's great news that um, we can be confident of our hope in Jesus. And um, yeah, that, that's really uh, amazing because the reality is though, for those who don't know Jesus, who, who don't love God, um, they are still in their sin and they still do need to fear judgment. Um, Hebrews 10, 31, I think I've mentioned this a few weeks back. It says it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So it would, it's right to um, fear the judgment for those who don't yet believe in Jesus. Um, but for those of us who do, uh, we don't need to fear judgment. So that's the first thing I'd say. And the second one I'd say in relation to elsewhere in the Bible talking about fearing God one of the things that I love about the scriptures is that God is not able to be boxed in as much as we'd like him to. So, you know, at, at one point it'll talk about his amazing love and, you know, how wide and deep and vast is God's love for us. Uh, and elsewhere, 
uh, it'll talk about, um, you know, fear God and love, uh, fear God and obey his commandments, sorry. Um, elsewhere, it'll talk about how he's all powerful and in control of everything. You know, there's so many uh, ways in which God describes himself that he can't simply be boxed in. There's always these sort of tensions that sometimes for us can't make total sense, but um, it's all part of God's character uh, of who he really is. So we don't fear judgment, um, but we, uh, and we have God's love for us. Um, and yet there's that certain respectful kind of fear, a bit like you might fear your, your own father or something like that out of respect, not a, um, kind of a scare, a scared kind of fearfulness. Hopefully that makes sense. Mm. What about you, Kira? You got anything to add to what Pricey said? Yeah, so I, I looked into this a little while ago, so I actually had to answer this question for one of my kids' church kids. So they were only like eight and they were asking me this question. And so I actually stood up in church um, and I found this illustration and I did, um, yeah, this big illustration. And the idea was I'm not going to do the whole illustration with all the sound effects and it goes for like eight minutes. <laughs> but the idea is um, that I talked about a little boy and his name was Johnny. And Johnny is late to soccer practice. Um, so he needs to take a shortcut. So he goes through the park um, and he comes to a highway. This is a three lane highway. And what do all mums say? You don't go across a three lane highway. It's dangerous, but he's late. And it's the quickest way that he's got to get across this highway. So Johnny looks out and there's high speed traffic going everywhere, but he waits for it to a break in traffic and he runs out onto the first lane all of a sudden this bus comes from nowhere and nearly wipes Johnny out he jumps back and realizes he's got to wait a little bit longer so he goes on and on and on like this and Johnny goes onto the second lane same thing happens he's got to run back third lane a sports car nearly takes him out and some guys yelling at him and he ends up back where he started and he doesn't know how he's going to get across the road. He realises, he thinks that's the only way, but it's a 100% death rate, like he's going to die if he goes across the highway. So he's sitting down. Johnny's really upset. He's late for soccer practice. A man comes by and points in this direction. What Johnny didn't realise is when he looked to his left that there was actually a footbridge that went over the highway. Um, and so the fear of going across the highway actually led to Johnny being wise and going over the footbridge every time he needed to get across the road. So the idea is of that was Johnny's um, was right to fear the cars and the trucks and the highway because the highway is our sin and God will judge us, all of us, for all the things that we've done wrong. So we're actually all in trouble. Like we all gonna face judgment. And the cars are God's punishment. That's his judgment that we will die because of the sin, because um, of what we've done wrong, we will die. So we are right to fear God's judgment, but fearing God in the right way and his judgment actually leads to us being wise. And because if our fear is placed in the right Way, when we know God's judgment is death and we deserve it, that it actually will make us turn to Jesus, who is the footbridge. Um, and so it's the same God whose punishment for sin is death, but it's the same God as well that sent his only son so that we could be saved, which is so, so awesome. So we don't need to actually live in fear of God's judgment when we've accepted Jesus. Um, and when we have the right idea of the actual judgment and punishment that we deserve when we look at it and we go you know what um, i understand the weight of that um, then we can actually find god's perfect love that gives peace in the midst of that fear so it's like it's like this weird kind of idea like what pricey said it's not like like looking to your dad it's not like this fear and just terrified but you have a healthy fear i really don't want to cross a three-lane highway and die healthy fear of my judgment is death but that leads me to the peace in God because I chose a footbridge so I don't have to worry about the highway. And I just found that super helpful in understanding the fear of God. That is helpful, but I, I, I can't help but think how much easier Frogger would have been if he just had a bridge. 
<laughs> well, and was the kid, is, is the kid that you said that illustration to, is he totally petrified to cross the road now? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm worried that that, I'm worried that, that kid was unsatisfied with your answer at kids at kids um, church and put that <laughs> question in and he just got it again. Yeah. You got anything to add, Mike? <laughs> I think it's been answered very well. I've, got, I've just got my anxiety calmed down at the moment. I'm just a bit worried. Oh, Johnny. For a, a little Timmy, Johnny. No. Um, I think uh, I think one of the things, this was something I really wrestled with as a teenager as well, because I know um, I would hear these passages like out of 1 John saying, you know, that p perfect love drives out fear. And then you would read in, say, Proverbs chapter 1, uh, verse 7, I think it is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And chapter 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then you find in the Old Testament that God is always saying, fear the Lord and serve him only, uh, or fear the Lord and put your trust in him. And so it's really quite confusing to work out what, how do I fear, or in what sense do I fear this God uh, when I'm also supposed to love him and trust him, how do those two things work together. And I think actually uh, one of the things that helped make it uh, clearer in my mind was understanding how fear is uh, always a factor in our lives, that we always fear something. And if you're not fearing God, you're fearing the opinions of your friends or you're fearing the failure in your own life. And those things that you fear end up controlling your decisions and the way that you, um, uh, the, the, the choices that you make in your life. A bit like uh, we've heard in the illustration with crossing the road, right? Those fears actually drive us. And, and so God says in his wisdom, fear me and trust me. You know, I, I'm not a, a God that keeps you awake at night in terror that I'll act unpredictably, but I'm actually, am a, I am at the center of the universe. I do control all things. And you take your uh, cues from me. You, you, base your decisions on the fact that I'm in control, not the fact that you're in control, or even that your friends' opinions are what dictate you know, reality and your choices. And that's actually a really liberating thing. It really frees you up to know that God is trustworthy um, and to fear him means that he's actually at the centre of the universe and you're not. So that really helps me. And just for good measure, there's a wonderful quote that often gets spoken about from C.S. Lewis in the Narnia series where... Um, I think it's Lucy says to Mr. Beaver or to Mr. Tumnus, one of those ones, you know, when she works at Aslan's a lion and she says, you know, oh my goodness, is he safe? And she says, no, he said, of course he's not safe. He's a lion, but he's good. And that's the point, right? Is that God is, uh, he, he's to be feared because he's all powerful, but he's good. And so really you, you take your judgments and your, um, uh, your cues from what he says rather than what anyone else says. Uh, and we don't fear his punishment, just like uh, what Steve said as well. Hmm. It's really helpful. Uh, moving on a little bit more practically, um, uh, we've got this question. That wasn't practical? Sorry? <laughs> Was that not practical? No, it's very practical. Don't, <laughs> don't cross the road. Don't cross a three-lane highway. Don't cross the three-lane yeah. highway <laughs> when there's a footbridge there. Um, <laughs> um, in, in my experience doing youth ministry, there's been there's been no other ministry of mine that's been more rewarding. But in the, in in kind of a similar way, there's never been a ministry that has been more stressful for me as well. And that's kind of that's that's the tension that I've had with youth ministry over the years. I love it, but it's stressful and it can be discouraging, just like all ministry can be discouraging. Um, so we've had a we've had a great question come in. Uh, which is uh, from one of the youth in our diocese asking, um, as youth that attend youth groups, how can we be an encouragement to our youth leaders? Do you want to kick us off, Kieta? Yeah, sure. Um, I think as youth, um, it's good to remember that um, your youth group leaders, they don't run youth group just because they don't have anything else to do Friday night. And they thought, what the heck, I'm just going to run a youth group, like, because I've got all this free time on my hands. Or they're wanting to relive their own youth group days. <laughs> That's not why we do it. Um, so our whole goal and desire is to see you grow in Jesus and see your relationship move further and strengthened in God. So um, a few ways that you could encourage your youth leaders, I guess, is actually thank them verbally. Um, and yeah, just go up to them and say, thanks for all you're doing. Sometimes that can go a long way when you realize, oh, they're actually grateful for the effort that we're putting in because there's so much effort that goes into running youth ministry behind the scenes. <laughs> 
So, um, yeah, thank you, youth leaders. Um, I taught how to chat to my husband about this question because he helped with youth group last year. And one thing he found so helpful was during youth, the actual youth group, when they would break into small groups, he said, I would be so encouraged if they actually engaged in the question. So when, yeah, when your youth group leader, you're in your small groups and they're actually asking you what you think actually engage and be like, this is what I think, or I don't understand, instead of just a blank look, maybe just say, hey, I don't understand that. Can we get a bit more into that or something like that? Um, thinking about COVID-19, the stuff that's coming out online for you youth are, is amazing at the moment. So this Q and A has been running and I know devotions, there's like so much going on. Your own churches are putting stuff up online. Um, a great way to show how grateful you are is to participate um, and comment, actually watch the things that are going up online, share it with your friends. Um, yeah, and yeah, because we've had we've had a situation where we've asked, had our youth say, please, can you put something up online? And so we're doing stuff every week. We do a half an hour youth online, but then half our youth aren't watching it. And they're the ones that wanted it. So, you know, if you're wanting these sort of things, get online, watch it, enjoy it, grow. Give me some questions <laughs> for next week. <laughs> what about yeah. you, uh, I just want to say amen to that. I just think that was that was fantastic. I, I think, uh, you know, all those things are excellent. One of the, the big things for me, having done some long-term youth ministry, is just to see uh, young people who um, I knew as kids and then and, uh, teenagers who were committed to Jesus still following Jesus all those years later. That is the, the most encouraging thing. So, um, yeah, stick with it. And you know, have a crack and engage, just like Kiara said. I think that's amazing. What about you, Uncle Steve? How can youth encourage their youth leaders? It's stone cold. Um, yeah, no, amen. <laughs> again, uh, I was literally going to say, turn up and engage. Yes. yes. The end. All right. Um, <laughs> very good. <laughs> yeah, that was a quick question to um, to get through. Uh, participate and engage and um, watch, watch privately in my devotions every week because as you've just heard from Kiana, they're excellent. Amazing. <laughs> so I listen to them. I listen to them all the time. I love them. <laughs> uh, you, put these, you put all this stuff out. You don't know if anyone's going to watch it. It's good to know you are, Kiana. <laughs> love <good>. Romans. <laughs> well, let's move on. Um, what advice would you give? I think this, this is from the perspective of... Uh, a, a leader. Uh, what advice would you give to someone, uh, a teenager who says they follow Jesus, but in their life, they always try and fit in with the world? How would you uh, answer that question, maybe for a leader, Mike? Mm. I mean, this, this is a tricky one. This, in one sense, is kind of like the, the normal experience of uh, Christian life, you know what I mean? But you, you follow Jesus and you, you live in the kingdom as a citizen of heaven, but you still live in this world. And this, this world uh, has a lot of pulling power, like to, to kind of, there's a lot of things in this world that are really attractive and kind of, a, you know, uh, like bright flashy lights that we want to cling on to. All of us want to belong with certain peer groups and be thought of well by those around us. And so it's really hard to say, you know, I follow Jesus, but I also really want to live in the world and do these kinds of things. I think at the heart of it always, it's about the, the challenge of, um, reordering our loves and, and actually seeing that life to the full is in Jesus and is nowhere else to be found. So one of the things I think is I found really quite helpful, this is you know for my own life as much as for um, ministering to young people and others, is actually trying to get to the heart of what, what is it that's attractive that you uh, about this way of life or thing that you're pursuing? And then to really ask the question, does, does this, like what sort of life is it promising and does it deliver or can it deliver? Because one of the things you, you find out is that if life is only to be found in Jesus, everything else that um, uh, promises life in the end can't deliver if it only is found in Jesus. And so you have to kind of just 
you know, push that thesis, keep pushing that kind of test to see where does every other promise kind of fall down. And so, you know, uh, one of the big promises that you're going to hear from, you know, your friends at certain times or even from your school is that, you know, if you, you study hard enough and apply yourself, you can have anything that you want. Or if you go to this party or if you hang out with these people, if you wear these clothes, if you say these things, then, you know, then you'll be happy and fulfilled. Now, just kind of push those things a little bit further and try and work out what's the consequence of that. You know, if you're only ever worried about, you know, fearing the opinions of your friends, well, that's basically just enslaves you to doing whatever they want. And that's a really uh, anxiety-provoking way to live and doesn't actually give you life. It actually crushes your life mm. and squeezes out your opportunities. Um, if you listen to perhaps your teachers in your school or maybe it's even your parents who say you just must study lots and lots so you can get a good job and be successful, well, that puts all the pressure for your life onto your shoulders when actually you can't control the world. And so no wonder, you know, we have a mental health epidemic amongst our young people because we've said to them that God doesn't decide your future, you decide your future. And now what happens if you don't get the HSC mark that you want? And what happens if you don't get the girlfriend or the boyfriend that you'd like? What happens if you don't get the career that you want? Well, you know, whose fault is that? And, and in the end, we're saying that's your fault. And that's, that's a lot of pressure to bear. And of course, if you succeed, you know, everyone will praise you and say, wow, you're the, you can be the next Mark Zuckerberg and you're so amazing. Look what you've done in your life. And that's great. But that's not most of us. That might be well, probably 0.1 of a percent of us. There's only one Mark Zuckerberg. Um, but then, you know, everyone else that doesn't quite get there is a failure. And I don't want to have to bear the, the, the cost of that. And so I think in the end, test, work out what are the things that are attractive in the world um, and then compare them with life in Jesus and just ask the questions, be curious about what it is. And in the end, if that person can't see uh, how only life is found in Jesus and the things that they're chasing after will really eventually lead to death, then there's, there's not much else you can do about that except pray for them and keep talking, keep bringing them to the scriptures, keep trying to expose the false idols in our world. Uh, and God willing, they'll, they'll see the light and life and hope that we have in Jesus. Hmm. What about you, Stone Cold? What do you reckon? Yeah, look, I, I just echo what Mike was saying. Um, it's really that idea. I think John Stock talked about it, that we're between two worlds. Uh, Romans 7, Paul talks about the same idea, this real struggle uh, um, with sin. Um, so, yeah, the struggle is real uh, for all of us. And I think the big thing that I would want to be um, pointed to them to, and it might sound like a broken record, um, but point them to Jesus. Uh, that is, you know, I shared that verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, um, which talks about, you know, worldly sorrow brings death, uh, godly sorrow brings repentance. So I wonder if in this situation that they would actually feel guilty anyway about whatever it is that's happening. And uh, so ultimately want to point them to the, as Mike said, the, the liberating good news of Jesus Go to the cross. Go to Jesus. You're liberated and you're set free. You're set free from the burden of guilt, from sin, uh, from the pressures, like all those things Mike was talking about. Go to Jesus. Uh, I encourage him to do that. Mm. What do you reckon, Kieta, if we, if we change the question a little bit, uh, one of the difficulties for lots of uh, teenagers is that they go, go to youth group and they grow up with kids in church and then the, the normal experience is that they'll see kids drop off, which can be heartbreaking for teenagers and kids to see their Christian friends. Um, what, what wisdom can we give someone who is seeing their Christian friend slowly slip away from trusting in Jesus? Yeah, it's such a hard one. It's um, even not just for a youth, but for even an adult, like just to see someone. I've had friends who have seemed to be following God and on fire for him. And then over the years, you've just watched them to the point where they're no longer even like acknowledging Jesus um, as even the saviour of the world or anything at all. And it can be really hard. Um, I think... Um, thing I would say and it's not a cop out but it is pray like it really is the number one thing that you can do because 
nothing, actually nothing you can do um, can bring them back. Only God can. He's the only one that can save. And so taking them continually to God um, in your prayer, um, actually it helps you as well. It gives you this overwhelming continual love for them as well as you pray for them and you bring them um, to God. If they're a close friend, I'd encourage you to speak honestly with them that you may not get the answer that you want, but sometimes it can help just to be like, you know what, I'm just noticing that you're not doing what God has asked you to do or you're not living the life that you should if they're a close friend. And sometimes that can be enough. Um, I had a friend who was slipping away. You could see by her behavior and it was only until another friend brought it up that she realized, like she hadn't actually realized um, the extent of how her behavior and how it was just slowly changing and um, yeah she was being influenced more and more by the world rather than by the gospel um, yeah and just encourage you to if you're really struggling with it speak to a youth leader as well because they can help you and just say hey I'm just noticing my friend this is what's happening how can I support them because that youth leader most likely will know this person as well if they're in youth group or and they can also help you along the road you're not alone in it um, but I want to acknowledge that's really hard yeah if you have if that's happening that's hard hmm. it is hard yeah you got anything to add pricey yeah, I'd echo what um, Kieta said about, um, first of all, praying. Uh, the second one I'd want to say is in regards to guilt, uh, as in your own guilt for that person. At the end of the day, you're not their saviour. Jesus is. Um, if you think it's all about you know, your relationship with them or something, um, then you'll be totally weighed down by that. Um, so ultimately, again, I know I'm a broken record. Point them to Jesus. Um, he is their saviour. He's their Messiah, uh, not you. And in my experience um, of people who have kind of started to go down this path, uh, generally the issues that they have are peripheral issues. Um, in my experience, so not, they haven't been central to Jesus. It's been like, oh, you know, Christians have done this or, or whatever it might be. And so actually having discussions that point them back to Jesus the whole time and say, yeah, but but talk to me about Jesus. What do you think about Jesus and, and what he's done for you? And that's been really helpful to say, yeah, well, I believe he, he died and rose again and what have you. So keeping on pointing them back to the heart of their faith. Um, and, and then you can work out those peripheral things, um, but keep coming back to Jesus. What do you reckon, Mike? Yeah, look, I've had the, the sadness, like most people, of seeing a, a friend uh, walk away from Christ and, uh, and certainly also some youth group kids do that as well. I've also had the joy of seeing some of them come back. So about 10 years later, after youth group, they've come back and become Christians and they're still Christians. So you never want to give up hope, uh, even if you see someone... Uh, you know, basically even blatantly say, actually, look, I'm giving up on Jesus for the time being. I'm going to go pursue whatever. Then don't give up on hope and, and so therefore pray for them. And, of course, if you're willing to speak directly to them about it, that at least kind of puts it on the table. It's not like a little hush-hush thing that no one can ever talk about or an elephant in the room. And I think that also makes it easier for when they want to reconnect uh, whatever happens in their life and they want to reconnect, they, they can come and talk to you because they know that you've spoken about it, you know, frankly with them in the past. And so I've done it. I've also done a couple of really uh, kind of ballsy things. So this kind of depends on your relationship to the person. Um, I had a, like a, a senior youth group kid that I'd know, known for ages and he was basically making a whole bunch of life choices to walk away from Jesus, but still kind of wanted to hold on to the Christian tag. And so I sat down with him and, and we read uh, the parable of the four soils and uh, I asked him which soil did he think he was, you know, the crowded soil, um, the shallow soil and so on. And, and, you know, to his credit, he was like, yeah, I'm feeling like I'm kind of like the crowded soil. I've got a lot of other stuff going on. I'm like, okay, you know, what does Jesus say about that? And then uh, I then also read the story in Mark's gospel of the rich young ruler who, you know, Jesus says, give away all your money, come follow me. And it's like, ah, money, Jesus, not really worth it. I'm going to stick with money. And then just to kind of top it off, I then read uh, the, the prodigal son with him at the end um, to say, look, I can see that you're basically heading in this direction. Just want you to know there's always a way back. And, and that's, that was now about six years ago. And I, we haven't really spoken much since, but I'm hoping, praying that one day he'll be like that prodigal son. Yeah. Sometimes uh, doing ballsy stuff can work. There was a period in my life that 
when I was a teenager, I'd stop going to youth group and, um, and my mates, uh, I, I, I kind of hated them at the time for doing it, but in hindsight showed great love on their part for wanting me to come back. Um, not just to youth group, but kind of reorientate my life around Jesus. And it, it must've been like the second or third week that I'd bailed on youth group for some lame reason, like I had homework to do. And if anybody knew me, like they were, they were real friends, they knew that that was not an excuse because I never did homework. So it was completely false. And, and one night they rocked up at my house. The, the, the youth leader had driven them all around to my house and they stood on the front doorstep saying, we want you to come to youth group. And I, and I went back. So sometimes being ballsy can, um, can, can work, but pray for your yeah. mates, pray for them, encourage them. As, um, What's that proverb? Wounds from a friend can be trusted, you know, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, true friends don't always tell us what we want to hear. They tell us what we need to hear. And um, if they're true friends, we'll listen to them. Um, moving on, question number six for tonight. Um, during the last couple of months, we've had stuff that we can't do. So the question is, uh, what is on top of your bucket list? after corona mike the hammer dicker what's on top of your list uh i was thinking about this when i first saw the question i thought what's in your bucket of corona i'm like <laughs> the corona right like, it's a bucket of coronas <laughs> so i don't know what that says but um i maybe i feel like i think i feel like tacos and like a bucket of coronas that's what i feel like going to a yeah going to a mexican place um, but I, I think no, actually I, I want to go. Isis. It's Forex and two is new. Oh, sorry. So, sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I don't drink Coronas anyway. I mean, it's yes. just that kind of import of stuff. Um, uh, look, I think actually I just want to go camping. I want to go camping with some mates. Like we had, um, we were going to have like an Easter thing with some friends and go camping and that all got totally canned. And I think uh, that's what I want to do. I want to go, go out to the bush and kind of, you know, do bush things in the bush. Yeah, Kieta, you, well, you just want to go to Bellingen. We'll move on. Um, <laughs> you very much. What, what's on top of your bucket list, Kieta? I was thinking about this, and it's mine was actually so completely boring because our home has been turned into this studio. So we look like we're on a movie set because we're filming like youth online, kids church online and church online all from our dining room. So our dining room table's pushed up. We can't even eat on the dining room table. There's cameras and lights and the green screen. And I'm just looking forward to having a normal dining room. Again, like without it looking like we're making our own motion picture. <laughs> I can, I, can, I can relate to that. Yeah, that'd just be nice. And I'm also looking forward to church camp. We had to cancel our church camp. And um, I love church camp every year. And, yeah, I can't wait to do that. What about you, Pricey? You can't say you too. You can't say manly. What are <laughs> you? can't say taking a nap. <laughs> What's oh. your, yeah, or taking a nap. What's on top of your yeah, I'm done. I'm done then. Oh, you're done. <laughs> Okay. No, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next school holidays just being a little bit spontaneous. That is, we're going to go away somewhere and I don't know where. Um, I'm just totally last minute. You know, I don't know if we'll be able to go to New Zealand, but hey, maybe we'll go to New Zealand. Maybe we'll, wow. go, maybe we'll go to the snow. I don't know. Just last minute, just suddenly, whatever border is open. <laughs> Maybe we'll just go there. I think Queensland, New Zealand's going to open their borders. <laughs> I think New Zealand's going to open their borders before Queensland yeah. at this rate. So. Yeah. I think I think that declaration is going to make Queensland keep their border closed. Yeah, <laughs> Christy might turn up there with his family. As I say, Anastasia Palaszczuk is like, nah, we're closed. Corona, I do love Noosa. But we don't want the prices here. I do love Noosa. We get a coffee from Noosa. Right, there you go. I'm, um, I'm, I'm going to Byron Bay in two days and I can't wait. That's kind of been on top of my bucket list for about four years. So, <laughs> and, I've, and I've been there in those four years, but that's how high it is on my bucket list. I just want to go hang out with all the, all the, all the hippies, all the Kieta people who are happy, full of life. 
and um, <laughs> I can't wait. And eat tacos with a with a with a bucket of Coronas. <laughs> Probably There's not. a really Basil. good taco place in Byron. A really good Mexican good. place. Don't um. I shouldn't have said that. That's the worst thing about telling people that you're going away on holidays and where you're oh, going yeah. to. Do. There's always fear that people will come. I don't think people will. But um, anyway, my phone will be off. Don't call me. Um, <laughs> let, let, let's move on. Um, during my time in ministry, so this is the question we've got in. It's not me personally. During my time in ministry, I've seen lots of different ways of doing youth ministry. Uh, some, some try to make things fun with games and others teach the Bible. Is belonging or believing best? What's your preference and why? Stone cold. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, look, I've heard this question for a long time, and I, I really do think that it's a bit of a false dichotomy. Uh, that means we, we're talking about, we, we seem to be separating these two things unnecessarily. Um, you know, or we either play games or we uh, teach the Bible. Um, why can't you do both? And I, in fact, I like when you gather together with a bunch of youth, surely you want to try and have some fun together. Um, and obviously as, as Christians, we want to be reading the scriptures together. So, and we believe that the, the uh, Bible is living and active and that's what does the work. Um, so I'm very passionate to say that I think it's both and rather than either or. Um, if you want to just turn up and play games, then go and join a sporting team or something. Um, but having fun and uh, the word together, I think is a, a beautiful symbiosis uh, for the scientists out there. Um, and just sharing my own experience as well, I guess, um, you know, I wasn't going to youth group for a long time and then some mates invited me to go along and we played touch footy for about an hour or so under lights on a Friday night. And then we'd go and read the Bible for probably an hour. Um, so for me, it was this beautiful kind of, you know, you go and have fun together with the fellas and then, but you seriously dig into the word as well. So I think the two can go together. What do you, what do you reckon, Mike? You think about these sort of things probably a bit more than us on kind of a what's important kind of level where most of the youth ministry happening in our diocese is kind of, happening with volunteers that don't have much time to think about what they're doing. They just kind of go with the flow and make it happen. Um, yeah, look, I, I think Steve's right. Like the whole false dichotomy thing, it doesn't have to be a choice between fun or Bible. And in fact, one of the things that uh, is one of my pet hates that I hear all over the place is when someone gets up to introduce people to their youth group and say, welcome everybody. So glad you're here. Uh, we're going to dig into God's word tonight. We're going to be looking at Galatians. It's going to be amazing. We think about circumcision, all kinds of crazy stuff. But before we get into the Bible, um, we're going to have some fun. And I think that, that firstly, in that phrase, what you've just said is that the Bible is boring and we're going to have to do that bit because we're Christians and that's non-negotiable. So suck it up. But before we do that, we're going to give you this wonderful entree. That's really what we want to do not this thing over there. And I think actually that, that's the real problem, right? It's not that you might do fun or Bible. It's that everyone's trying to do both, but if they're really honest, they don't think the Bible can be fun. Um, and so you've got to kind of sweeten the deal somehow. It's like, you know, the bait switch, you know, come because we're going to do this amazing game and then we'll kind of tack this boring Bible bit on the end because we're Christians and we have to. And so in the end, I think the, the question kind of comes down to what do you want to spend your energy on doing you know you're going to do fun and you're going to do bible at youth group because you're christians and because you really value community and join your time together so great excellent what do you want to spend your energy on and I, I want to say rather than spending all your energy on making the best most fun most attractive most wonderful kind of epic event that everyone in your town or area wants to come to you know it's going to be a pizza flung out of a slingshot like an angry bird staying into a swimming pool of you know um Cheese, who, who knows, right? Um, instead of doing that, say, let's spend all your energy on trying to make the Bible really engaging as it is, right? So spend all the hours and time that you have in your week trying to bring this word to life and make it relevant and impactful and engaging and enjoyable 
for your young people and then also do the other stuff, which is history building, but don't let that kind of derail your time and your energy. And, and so uh, here's the last thing I want to say about this is that you don't want to choose between fun and the Bible, but I don't think actually you want to think about fun at all. Just kind of park fun to the side and instead of fun, think about joy. And so when you come together for your youth group, have a, a joyful time. And joyful times at youth group don't always have to be exciting. You're not always having the best time of your life all the time. Like, you know, occasionally you have really fun moments, but most of your life is quite boring. But even in that, you can have lots of joy. And, you know, you can be joyful while, while someone at youth group is grieving the death of a, a beloved grandparent. You can have joy at youth group when things are going really great for, for people around you. You can have joy at youth group when the world is collapsing and it's coronavirus. You can have joy at youth group in good times and in bad. And you can have joy when you're reading the Bible and it's hard and joy when you're reading the Bible and it seems really easy and, and wonderful. But think about joy rather than fun and think about how you can use your time wisely to, to bring God's word to life so that young people want to read it and engage with it and love it. And the reality is that Galatians chapter five has some really fun stuff to say about circumcision. Yes, so it does. Get into it. <laughs> ask your, um, ask your youth leader to, to, to do a talk series on that. And they'll, they'll thank you. That's one of the other, <laughs> one of the other ways that you can encourage your youth leaders is by asking <laughs> them to preach on passages like that um, in an appropriate way. Anyway, that's the challenge anyway. What do you reckon, Keta? Um, yeah, well, I, I think both belonging and believing is vital as well. Like we need both. I've actually seen youth groups that um, are all just about, like they leave out the belonging part. And so it is all just fun and games, but it's nearly superficial. Like it's not just, you don't even... Even they even might even preach the Bible, but there's no relationship. So the youth leaders aren't actually investing into the lives of the kids and seeing where they're at and what they're doing. And then on the flip side, I've seen it the other way where, yeah, it's just, it is just boring. Like you don't want to be there and the kids, yeah, why would they choose to be there? So I think both like believing it's important, we need to be teaching the word of God. Like that's living and that's why we're there is to see them growing God. But they need that sense, not so much of fun, but of belonging as well, that they have a place that's safe, that people that know them, that have their back. Um, so my only advice on top of what the other guys have said is um, be leaders that invest beyond youth group be leaders that actually invest in the lives of your youth beyond that Friday night. Because, um, yeah, that's, to me, in my own life, that made the biggest impact is having yeah, leaders who actually, I was like, oh, my goodness, they actually care from week to week, remembered what I had said in small groups that I was struggling with this. And the next week, Kiara, I've been praying for you. How did you go with that? What? So, yeah, invest. Yeah, that's really important to um, to remember because mm. without that, youth group can become like a drop-in centre Yeah. Um, that has no continuity, has no ongoing care. It's just a place where teenagers come and um, we want to care for them. And as uh, Pricey's told us and keeps telling us, it's an opportunity for us to invest and point them to Jesus. Mm. And um, you do that if you invest. Yeah. Um, very good. That's really helpful, guys. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Patricia Werakun on, and we were thinking about sex and relationships. And I think that's where our last question for tonight uh, has come from, uh, as we touched on uh, this issue a couple of weeks ago. Uh, one of our youth leaders wants some advice. Uh, in youth group, how can we encourage guys and girls uh, to be good friends while the culture around us wants to make everything about sex? and romance. Mike. Yeah, um, that's a really great question. I think uh, some of the things you have to do is just stop back, uh, like stop for a second and just think about the language you use and the kind of habits and things that you do in youth group that perhaps um, also either sexualize relationships or perhaps um, drive too much of a wedge between male and female because um, often we focus more on our differences than what we have in common and so you might have a, a girl's night or a guy's night or whatever but then in doing that uh, you, you end up kind of 
um, making them kind of aliens of each other, if you know what I mean. They're, they're, there's nothing kind of in common. And that also makes it really quite difficult just for people to treat each other like humans and be friends and love each other. And so I think one of the big things that we can do in our churches, full stop really, is think about how we can just be better friends together, how we can relate to each other without any of that kind of sexual tension and just think, you know, here is a brother and sister in Christ who I want to love and look after and be friendly to and not have to think about all those other kind of uh, dynamics and pressures that the rest of the world um, puts on us. So I think stop for a second, think about the language you use as you talk about maybe even what manliness or what it means to be a female. Um, don't be scared of kind of mixing people together and don't make a big deal of it. Uh, don't play games at youth group that really play on the sexual awkwardness of teenagers. I, I don't know if anyone in the world is still doing this game, but there are games where, you, you know, you have to pass an orange like from neck to neck and it's like boy, girl, boy, girl, or you put a, a lifesaver on a toothpick and a girl has a toothpick and a boy has a toothpick and you've got to pass the lifesaver from your lips to there. Or here's, here's a terrible one. It's probably the worst one I've ever heard is you get like a sheet of perspex and you put honey on both sides of the perspex and a guy and a girl, they have to lick off the honey and see who gets the honey off first. But if you think that's bad, someone told me at their youth group, it got done with glad wrap, glad wrap plastic. Can you, can you believe that? Right. These are games that people used to play at youth group. Honey, if you love me, give me a yes. smile. Like, yes, yeah. that's the worst. Like, you've just, firstly, you've just get rid of all of them. You've just unlocked a whole lot of memories that I've and lost them up in a cabinet. You've just, anyway. Yeah. So, after this. Yeah. All those youth youth activities. Firstly. They're not safe ministry acceptable or safe, so gone. Uh, th secondly, the other thing is that they're, they're, um, they're also kind of, they bring all that kind of sexual tension and pressure into your youth group and you don't need it. So get rid of all those kinds of things and just focus on actually doing activities that help people treat each other like humans and talk to each other that way. So do those kind of things. I think that really helps. Um, and I had another one, but I forgot. I'll come back to it if I think of it. That's right. Well, um, what do you what do you reckon, Keta? How do we how do we help youth leaders run youth groups that kind of foster friendships? Yeah, I think what Mike said is is really good. Um, yeah, I think creating a culture within your youth group that is um, just a friendship and just hanging out. One thing that I found hard when I was in youth group was if a couple were running youth group. And they would say to us that we weren't allowed to touch or we weren't allowed to do all that, but yet because they were married, they would do it. And so instead be like your youth group leaders, even if you're married, it's not all, your life's not about sex and romance all the time. Like I'm actually a friend with my husband. I don't need to be just in that box with him. And so be a friend with your spouse if you're doing youth group together or be guy youth leaders, be friends with the girl youth leaders and actually show an example of that. We can actually have healthy relationships um, within our youth group. Um, and I would also say, um, same as Mike, I just want to echo it, is some of the most helpful youth group experiences I have had is when girl and boys are mixed in discussion groups. I think it just, it really helps you see someone else's godliness even. So if there's going to be a romance and relationship, why don't I put them in a group and they can actually see who's got their head screwed on and who's following Jesus and get a clear idea of what godly men and women look like. And yeah, just hang out together. I think just, yeah. Everyone hang out. It's good. Just everyone go hang out. Um, but after Corona's finished. After Corona. Yeah. yeah. And don't play sardines in the dark. We've got to go hide in small corners. <laughs> that one's also out. That's gone. I play that so much in you. <laughs> Basically, I don't think there's, I don't think there's really any game that we played when I was in youth group that, that you, you would even think about playing now. Um, no. All, all illegal. One. All illegal. Yeah, they are all illegal. You will go to jail for doing them. So don't. I just um, I remember the thing I was going to say before. Um, it, it's uh, about dating. One of the things I found the most liberating thing as when I was a teenager, and also uh, for, for my young people at youth group, was to say 
Um, firstly, just, you know, I mean, this is not a hard and fast rule, but it takes the pressure out of a room if you can say to people, why don't you just decide that you're not going to date or look for a girlfriend, boyfriend until after the high school? You know what I mean? Just, just say to yourself, it's not a thing for me. I'm going to wait, right? Because then when someone says, oh, have you got a girlfriend? You can kind of go, no, I don't have a girlfriend. And that's because I've decided that I don't want one yet till after high school, rather than that being a big deal. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, do you have a boyfriend yet? No, because I've decided I don't want one, rather than you can't get one. And that kind of really just takes a lot of the pressure out of a room. Of course, you know, teenagers will date, that kind of stuff will go on, but you don't want it to kind of invade your space and take over all the relationships, you know, like they've all got this agenda to them. You know, if you can take that out of the room, everyone can just be humans. Yeah. What do you reckon, Pricey? Um, I reckon I was playing um, Darling If You Love Me Smile in about year two. <laughs> That's cool. What is, what is uh, Darling If You Love Me? Are you from... I Honey, if you love me. From well, I can heal. Uh, posh. What's going on? Posh. Yeah. yeah. North Shore. It was a private school. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you love me. Oh, hey. Hey, what were you saying? Um, yeah, I was saying I was playing that game in year two. You know, the teacher encouraged, encouraged it at a Christian school, I might add. Um, Amazing. But um, just following up what these guys have been saying, I think um, I wonder if uh, with like small groups and that kind of thing, I think the message could be that it's really helpful to have a mixture of different things. You know, obviously at times it, it could be really helpful to have a small group of just boys or whatever and just mm -hmm. girls and then other, other times to have mixed or whatever, just to, th there's various things that are beneficial, I guess, about doing each of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one I probably just want to say is, and I, I look, I've been guilty of this, um, none, none of us are perfect, but, you know, sometimes we can even as leaders be the people who kind of talk up, um, oh, you know, are you keen on that girl or whatever? I guess just trying to um, shy away from that kind of talk and, and just encourage them, as everyone's already said, just creating a culture of um, hanging out as, as a group and people being open and honest about stuff so it doesn't just become like, oh, hey, those two people are hanging out. They must be boyfriend and girlfriend now or something. So, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Now, um, to, to, to finish off tonight, this is, a, this is a question off the cuff, but we've thought about weird games that we used to play when we were in youth group. And I want you to share with us just the, the weirdest, grossest game that you played uh, at youth group. Yes. And, I, and I'll, I'll give you a minute to, um, to, to think and remember, because I'll, I'll share mine. But the one that always uh, comes into my memory when you think about games that you just absolutely cannot play anymore, and I don't know if any other youth group played this, but I guess my leaders got it from somewhere, and it was you, you, had, you had a clear bit of kind of flexible PVC pipe, and you'd, you'd crack a raw air egg into it. And then you'd get two people, and they'd have to put their mouths over each end of the pipe and then blow as hard as they could into this pipe. And, and basically, it was a game to test who had the, the, the lower lung capacity. Oh. <laughs> Just when they were gasping for air, they'd cop a raw egg straight down. And, and we, we only played that once in youth group. And I, I gather that it hasn't really been played much since probably the mid-90s. But it was feral. It was just disgusting. So like, great. Everything about raw egg that is disgusting to eat anyway, to then enter a competition oh. where it could just... And, but what would happen is that the, the force would be so big that it would just, it would just go straight down. Like, no. there'd be no... <laughs> Have I given you enough time to think of your... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've got one. What do you reckon, Kieta? Yeah, so I remember turning up to youth group one week and they said we want a guy and a girl who know, who here could eat a whole Big Mac meal. Well, I shot my hand up because I love Maccas. And so we sat there, they got the Big Mac meal and then they put it in a blender, the whole yeah. thing, drink, burger, chips, blended it up and it was first one to chug it down. Oh, I couldn't. I just could not. That was so gross. And the thing was worse. Oh my God. The only 
only thing that didn't blend up was the pickle and it was floating. Oh. <laughs> Can I say that, that reminds that was me a my... little bit of the of my backyard this morning. There was lots of stuff floating around. <laughs> lots of pickle. That's it. My 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 first Sunday at Petersham as the the new ministry trainee there, they made me they they sprung it on me in front of everyone in the church service. They gave me a blended uh, Macca's meal to to chug up on stage. Not a big Mac meal because it was a ten a.m. service. It was breakfast menu. So it was a uh, bacon and egg McMuffin with a hash brown and orange juice. Oh, no. I was brushing my teeth for days and I still couldn't <laughs> get that taste. It was terrible. So it worked. 16 years. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Ways, 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 ways to, to welcome new youth ministers. Yeah. What's, what's your gross yeah. game, Pricey? Well, I was just thinking there's a lesson in that one for all of us, isn't there? That uh, when, you, when you have someone turn up new to your church, you blend up a meal and um, make them drink it. And I'm just imagining all the retirees or something just sitting in the, in the congregation just going, chug, 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 chug. <laughs> um, I actually have an image burnt into my brain now from what Mike said earlier. I can't stop thinking about the glad wrap with honey. Honestly, I just think, I just, I just can't, my memory has been erased. I'm just thinking about that. I just, I'm sorry, I can't help you at this point. Right. What about, what about you, Mike? What's the, what, uh, look, what, what's a gross, weird game that you yeah. can't do now? We, we, I mean, we used to do the iron gut type things where someone had to eat a block of cheese or a spoon of Vegemite or um, custards with raw pilchard fish in there that kind of stuff they were pretty gross but i think um the the most dangerous by far and this might be something that still happens in the armadale diocese i don't know was that um we went away on a youth group camp down in kutamundra and we went for a what they called a bunny bash in the late night yeah. and they put i don't know 30 40 kids on the back of a truck that was driving through the bush and it was pitch dark and no one could see anything and someone yelled out rabbit. And I'm pretty sure while this truck was driving along at about 30, 40 Ks an hour, we all jumped off the truck. Bodies went everywhere. And then everyone just kind of got up and charged off into the darkness, falling down wombat holes and I tripping over logs and no one knew where anyone was. And only now as an adult, do I look back at that and think who was in control? Like who knew what was going on? Like who was going to find the kid stuck down a, a, a wombat hole? Who knew where anyone was, right? Like it was the most ridiculous thing ever. But that was uh, that was youth group in the nineties. That's what oh, we, we did pretty... that in Armadale at the Pine Forest. We went bunny bashing so many times. Had a golf they... clubs. Yeah, no we, one hits. We now use them as the invite a friend night. Invite a friend night. Yeah, with the bunny bash. The bunny bash. Bunny invite a friend night. Um, anyway. It's terrible. It's terrible. Yeah, it's not good, is it? No, we don't. Do that. We absolutely don't do that, and we don't condone that. Um, no, be safe. Um, do your safe ministry course. Get your working with children check, and um, make sure you run safe ministry. That is the. Give everyone a high vis vest. Keep one point five meters away. Cotton wool. The whole bit. Yeah, that's right. Do you have anything to add, Pricey? Or I'll get you to pray. Well, to finish. Well, this again. I do actually remember being on a camp when I was very young um, and we were being towed around on the a VW um, bonnet. Um, you know, they're quite curved. And so it was being towed behind a car, like on a big wire, and we were sitting in the bonnet as he kind of gets swung around all over the place in the paddock. Um, I don't think it quite passes for... <laughs> Uh, oh, it's these days. The can I, no safety. Can I say that if uh, the, the real test for these kinds of things is the uh, your honour test, and so you have to picture yourself in a courtroom where a judge has just said, "So, what made you think it was a good idea to drag all the kids around behind a you in, in the uh, bonnet of a VW?" Uh, and you just say, "Well, we just, you know, we just didn't think anything would go wrong, Your Honour." And then see how that sounds coming out of your mouth. And then when you when you realise how dumb that sounds, you go, okay, we don't do it then. You know what I mean? Good test. Point, point, point people to Jesus. That's the message. Yeah, point people to Jesus. It made you fear death. 
That's true. That's true. <laughs> well, we've come full circle, haven't we? Because that's how we began. <laughs> um, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm going to get Pricey to, to finish, uh, wrap us up uh, by praying for all of us. And then um, I've got a couple of things to chat about. But how about we pray? Yeah, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of love. Thank you that you are all powerful and in control of all things. Uh, Lord, you are so much bigger than we can possibly fathom. Uh, you are so far beyond us and you love us uh, with a love that is so wide and vast and deep uh, that we are awestruck by you. Lord, it's easy for us to get bogged down in the details sometimes, uh, but Lord, help us to cling to you. Help us to encourage others in you. Help us to press on. Uh, that on that final day, we would hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Pricey. Well, as I said before, thanks for joining us this Sunday night. I hope that the last hour or so has been uh, a blessing to you. Uh, don't forget uh, to put your questions in the chat for when we come back and do these in a couple of weeks. Uh, Midweek Devotions is going to be back with me this week on Monday, Wednesday and Friday. We're going to, for the next couple of weeks, uh, we're giving Pricey a week off in two weeks. So you get two weeks in a row of me. We're going to look at James chapter one, which is a great chapter in the Bible, highly practical. And um, so join us for them four o'clock, Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays as we do them together. But thanks for joining us. Don't forget your questions and we'll see you soon. See you later. It's a